hands really grow in that old crate. I wonder what could have held the boys up. I never knew Mike to be late for a hunting trip. Where's Mike? Yeah, where's Mike? What's the matter, Sam? Has something happened? An accident at the mine. Mike got smashed up pretty bad. When did it happen? Early this morning. I came directly from the hospital. I thought you guys might want to run in and see him before it was too late. What about our hunting trip? Sure, Sam. Wait till I get my gun. The doc said Mike's condition is critical. I wouldn't feel much like hunting with Mike laid up. Here's Jim. Hop in and I'll take you guys at hospital. How'd it happen? Well, Mike's job was hauling ore from the face to a conveyor belt. His thoughts were on our hunting trip, and so he wanted to get the work done in a hurry. Notice how he rides with his back toward the direction of travel. He thinks he's saving a lot of time this way by not turning around on the return trip. Well, this is a very dangerous practice. What's that? You think he's driving too fast? Oh no, not Mike. He knows the haulage ways like a book. No accident can possibly Here again, Mike's still taking chances by riding backwards. The safety engineer doesn't approve of this kind of chance taking and stops Mike as he leaves the face. After pointing out possible dangers of shuttle car operation, he cautions Mike about operating his car when not facing in the direction of travel. You know the safety rules, Mike. And you ought to know they were made for your own protection. And what about those brakes? Have you had them checked recently? You do see that they're always kept in good shape, don't you? Okay then. But remember, be sure to turn around so that you'll be facing the right way on each trip. We might add, watch that speed. Now, doesn't that make steering much easier, Mike? Makes it easy to see where you're going, too, doesn't it? 
Besides, it's much safer. Mike seems to be doing all right now, so let's leave him and go over to a nearby drift where two men are moving a loading machine up to the face. The machine has just been repaired and they're returning it sooner than expected. This should help speed up production. What happened? Looks like power failure, but where? One man goes back to check the main power circuit while the other looks for the trouble at the machine. Uh-oh, here comes Mike with a loaded trip and fast. He doesn't know that a stalled loading machine is blocking his path. The operator at the machine hears him coming. He's going to try to flag him down. Mike sees him. It's too late, even for brakes. Mike thought it couldn't happen to him but it did. We'll go ahead, Harry. You return the car and we'll see you later. Hi, Mr. Morgan. Hello, fellas. Glad you could come. Hello. How's Mike? He's still unconscious. No one's allowed to see him yet. I see his wife got here pretty quick. Yeah, she's been here with their little girl ever since they brought him in. How bad is he hurt? Well, from what I could find out from the nurse, Mike was squeezed pretty bad through the chest and the stomach. I had warned Mike before about the way he was driving that shuttle car. Why didn't he listen? Probably figured, like so many others, that it just couldn't happen to him. But that's not straight thinking in any respect. The best way to be sure it won't happen to you is to follow the rules and don't take unnecessary chances. The way I see it, Mike was really sticking his neck out. He sure did. There's no getting around it. If you break safety rules, accidents are bound to happen. Now, if Mike had been driving in the right position, And if he had the car under full control when he approached the crosscut, he probably would have had time enough to use those brakes. He might be out hunting this very moment instead of in a hospital bed fighting for his life. So you see, it may be a big violation of a safe practice or a lot of small ones. Either way, the end may be disastrous if you keep on defying the law of averages. There's the nurse now. Maybe she can tell us how Mike's doing. How is he? There's some improvement. He has regained consciousness. Can we see him now? Not yet. He's still on the critical list, and the doctor says no visitors for the present. You know, the way Mike went right ahead, driving wrong, even after he was warned, reminds me of Joe's accident. I was in the mine when he was killed, and I can see it all happening again right now. Joe and the other haulage men are called to a meeting to discuss the bad practice that was causing so many haulage accidents. The safety engineer warns them about loose lamp cords and belts. and to be sure and wear leg bands. He then warned the men to keep away from the tight side of the haulage way and to never, no, never cross over a moving trip. As the session continued, the safety engineer stressed again the importance of following these safety practices. Here's Joe and his buddy again, on their way to an unloading point. Uh-oh, looks 
like their trip has derailed. Joe comes back to see what the trouble is. Looks like you'll need a set of re-railers for this job. waits for the high ball sign from Joe to start the trip moving. Before they go on, Joe removes the re-railers, then signals his buddy to start the trip rolling again. Wait, Joe wonders if he removed the re-railer from the other side. Watch that tight side, Joe. I can't figure out why a guy would try to cross a trip with the cars moving. And it's soon after he'd been warned about it. Well, maybe he forgot about safety because the cars seemed to be moving so slowly and for just a short distance. But nevertheless, the underlying cause of this accident was the workman's failure to think about his safety. But that isn't always the reason, is it? Can a man get hurt through someone else's carelessness? How about when the boss doesn't warn his men about a dangerous condition, or have that condition fixed before somebody gets hurt? Sure, sometimes it's that way. But to a dead man or a badly injured one, it doesn't make much difference who's at fault. Each workman has to watch out for himself to a certain extent. No one can depend entirely on the foreman or his buddy for his safety. That reminds me about another brakeman like Joe, who was killed because he thought his safety was entirely the foreman's responsibility. A loaded trip had to be pushed onto a sidetrack, a relatively simple and routine job. But water covered the track at a low point on the haulage road. Brakeman would have to walk through, unless he could hitch a ride through it. That's what he was trying to do when the safety engineer stopped him. He cautioned the brakeman about taking such unnecessary chances. The brakeman replied that he'd asked the boss several times to have that water drained off, but without... The safety engineer agreed to speak to the boss to see what could be done. Several days passed, but the water remained. When the brakeman and motorman saw the wet place again, they made some uncomplimentary remarks about bosses and safety engineers, then proceeded with their trip toward the switch. no one in authority was watching. So the brakeman attempted to hitch a ride again. There 
was some question as to who was to blame for the accident. But regardless of the answer, two wrongs never make a right, especially where the safety of men's lives or limbs is concerned. Dr. Martin wanted in the receiving room. Dr. Martin wanted in the receiving room. Say, isn't that the same doctor that treated Dave Johnson when he broke his leg last month? Yes. And as I understand it, Dave was another guy who had a hunting trip on his mind instead of his job. How was he injured? He was coupling some loaded cars and making up a trip for the main haulage locomotive. The loads are parked on a side track, and the locomotive has to back up to them. After throwing the switch, and on his way to the side track, he walked through a muddy spot on the roadway. Reaching the loaded cars, he signals the motorman to keep backing up. But as the moving trip rams the parked cars, the coupling fails to align. So Dave signals the motorman to try again. And this time, he tries to hold the coupling in place by pushing against it with his foot. You saw Dave after he was hurt, so you know the results of this accident. Yeah. I know it's a common practice at some mines, though a bad one, to line up couplings by kicking them. But Dave did it under the worst possible conditions, with wet, muddy boots, and with the locomotive backing up so fast. Would you like me to pick you up for a drink? Okay, up you go. I think your daddy's going to be all right. The accidents you have seen reenacted were based on case histories taken from official files. Accidents, particularly like Mike's, are caused by thoughtlessness, not thinking safely, not acting safely. It's that combination of thinking and acting, or knowing and doing, which makes a safety program effective and helps to reduce or eliminate hazards from working areas in a mine. This is a hunting license, giving the owner the privilege of shooting game in season. Now, for a thoughtless, careless, or foolhardy person, it can be a very dangerous privilege. The operation of mine haulage equipment is also a privilege that should be given only to qualified persons. But even so, operating and working around haulage equipment can still be hazardous unless workmen are constantly alert. Mental lapses 
and taking unnecessary chances are likely to result in bodily injury or death. So think before acting. Avoid shortcuts and be safe always.